Good evening. My name is Ryan Short, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We acknowledge the many indigenous peoples that lived on these lands, as well as the thousands of indigenous children forced into the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879 as a part of a federal cultural eradication effort. On behalf of the Clark Forum, Dickinson College, the Association of the U.S. Army, the Carlisle Area Chamber of Commerce, the Cumberland County Historical Society, the Joint Civil Military Interaction Network, Penn State Dickinson Law, the U.S. Army War College, the U.S. Peacekeeping Civility Operations Unit, and the Court Christie Institute, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, Transforming Conflict, Rethinking War, Peace, and Justice. This is the preclude event to the J. Sherwick McGinnis Jr. War, Peace, and Justice Symposium, which will take place this fall. After two decades of war in Afghanistan and Iraq, the loss of human life totaled 6,800 U.S. troops, 6,900 U.S. contractors, and 43,000 uniformed Afghan Iraqis and other allies. The war on terror was declared on September 20, 2001, and the economic cost is estimated somewhere between four to six trillion dollars. We must ask ourselves, was this war justified? The panelists will discuss this question and the overall outcomes the American people expect from armed conflict, including peace and justice keeping efforts. Daniel Conway is the Dean and the Donald J. Farage Professor of Law at Penn State Dickinson Law. She previously served as the Dean of the University of Maine School of Law, and in 2016, she retired from the U.S. Army in the rank of Lieutenant Colonel after 27 years of combined active reserve and National Guard service. Retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General James M. Dubik has over 37 years of active service. He is the former Commanding General of the 25th Infantry Division and former Commanding General of the 1st U.S. Corps. Dubik is the chair of the J. Wood Sherwood McGinnis Junior War Peace and Justice Symposium. He was also the Omar Bradley Chair of Strategic Leadership from 2012 to 2013, a position co-sponsored by Dickinson College, Penn State Dickinson Law, and the U.S. Army War College. Margie Ensign is the president of American University of Nigeria. Ensign held the university's presidency from 2010 to 2017 when she returned to the U.S. to become Dickinson's 29th president from 2017 to 2021. Ensign has been internationally recognized from her pioneering work at American University, including receiving the 2011 African, Amer African Leadership Award in Educational Excellence granted by London-based African Leadership Magazine. Andrew Wolf is an associate professor of political science and international studies at Dickinson College. Most recently, Wolf served as an associate fellow at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies Europe in Bologna, Italy in 2020 to 2021, and was a Fulbright NATO security studies scholar hosted by the College of Europe in Bruges, Belgium in fall 2021. Wolf's primary research interests are NATO enlargement, European security studies, and American foreign policy. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please type your questions into the live chat next to this YouTube video at any time. Please post questions only in the live chat feature. This is not the space for exchanging personal opinions during the event. And now please join me in welcoming President John Jones, who will share some remarks. Thank you so much, and uh, we welcome uh, everyone, uh, Professor and, uh, and General, and my friend, Dean Conway, who's in uh, virtually tonight. I love your glasses, Dean. They're, they're terrific. Uh, uh, they look great, and uh, we, we welcome uh, our, our uh, guests tonight uh, for this uh, very impactful and timely uh, session. Tonight's uh, conversation is, of course, a prelude uh, to a more in-depth program that uh, is scheduled for this fall. Uh, this is a project that was near and dear uh, to our former Dickinson president, my predecessor, and my friend Margie Ensign, who you're going to hear from uh, in a bit. It was brought to Margie's attention by a dear friend and devoted member of the Carlisle community, uh, Sherwood McGinnis. Sherwood, very sadly, as uh, those of you who are here know, and, and, and some of our audience knows, passed away uh, after a courageous battle uh, with, a, with a terminal illness uh, last November. Sherwood spent over 30 years serving in areas of national security, the rule of law, governance, economic development, and foreign policy. I didn't know Sherwood well, uh, but I know his legacy, and I know uh, what kind of man that he was. He was a force of nature. 
He was a leading citizen of this community in Carlisle. He was an active leader, and he was involved in more community organizations than we can possibly uh, count. He was a frequent visitor to our campus. Uh, he uh, could often be seen uh, visiting art exhibits at our Trout Gallery or enjoying the theater and musical performances. On April 2nd, the music department uh, suitably and appropriately will host a concert to honor Sherwood and his vision for the War, Peace, and Justice Project. And I certainly hope uh, that you'll be able to attend. It's part of Sherwood's, Sherwood's vision, and uh, what is especially exciting about this project is that it is the collaboration of community members and organizations, Dickinson, the U.S. Army War College, Penn State Dickinson uh, School of Law, and others. As president of this college, I'm proud to continue supporting projects that deepen our longstanding partnerships with these organizations. More specifically, this project will continue the work of Dickinson and the War College in bridging the military-civilian divide that happens all too frequently in this nation. This is a most important dialogue to have, and, and ever more so today. Uh, I, I think as, as uh, we discussed tonight uh, with the, some of the panelists at, uh, at dinner uh, before this event, uh, who among us uh, have not been glued to our TV sets, uh, watching the news, checking social media uh, to see the, uh, what, it, what is taking place, this searingly difficult time in the Ukraine, um, a war uh, that is virtually being uh, fought in, in real time uh, and available to anybody who cares to check in on it. I don't think Sherwood could have known, wouldn't have known at the time uh, that he suggested this to my predecessor, but I think he was pretty worldly wise and he knew that these conflicts would arrange, uh, would emerge rather, and arrange for this to be uh, a, a uh, seminar that, that could discuss generally uh, these world problems, but also, sadly, specifically uh, some conflicts that are taking place right now. So I hope you'll enjoy our program. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to General Dubik uh, and our panelists, and uh, I think this is going to be a wonderful uh, and, and very informative event. Thank you all. Well, thank you, President Jones. I appreciate the invitation to speak here. It certainly is an honor to be on the on the panel with uh, so many other distinguished guests, and especially to uh, honor Sherwood uh, in a way that uh, all of us uh, want to. As you said, there's no way we could have known uh, about uh, the war that's going on right now. And uh, it brings to mind the importance, not just of this discussion, but of the symposium that will come in the fall, the relationship between peace and war and justice. The importance of this topic is before us every minute. Social media, TV, radio, topics of conversations. So let me uh, introduce the, the forum, or the symposium in the fall, uh, in the following way, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, when we think about war, especially Americans, under the umbrella of war, we think of one thing, combat, fighting major combat operations. War is fighting. And of course it is. But this is, uh, I would say, way too narrow of an understanding of war. It, it is ahistorical. It's not how war is practiced. It's not how war is experienced. And it's not uh, a war that describes it as a human phenomena. It's a very narrow and legal definition of war, major combat operations, aggression and the reaction to it. It's necessary, but it's insufficient. Uh, it's insufficient first, if I go to the next slide, uh, because in addition to fighting a war, you have to wage a war. Fighting and waging go together. Fighting is a tactical and operational level, what happens on a battlefield. But wars are waged in capitals as well. And in uh, waging war, there's three main uh, activities. One, figure out what your war aims are, and then construct military and non-military campaigns uh, that together increase the probability of achieving your aim. Uh, second, 
make initial decisions, have an organization that can do that, and then as the war unfolds in unexpected ways, which all do, be able to recognize the gap between what you intended to achieve, what's actually happening, and then adapt and keep doing that until the war comes to a satisfactory close. And then last, uh, maintain legitimacy. Again, I'm speaking on behalf of the United States uh, audience. Maintain the legitimacy of the war in the eyes of the American people. Go to war for the right reasons. Fight it the right way. End it in a just manner. These are war waging skills that go on in every war in addition to the fighting. So right off the bat, the narrow definition of war as fighting is clearly insufficient. We have, unfortunately, 20 years plus since 9-11 of the experience of the relationship between waging war and fighting war. Few have been the times when we, uh, the United States forces or allied forces, have fought poorly. But uh, at the strategic side, the war waging skill, you can't really say that. But there's more under the umbrella besides war, war fighting and war raging. Go to the next slide, please. When you look at war as a human phenomenon, the fighting part is always preceded by pre-combat operations. If you look at our own um, Revolutionary War, and you ask someone, when did the war start? Uh, I would bet 95, 99% of people will say if they have an answer at all. 1775, Lexington and Concord. When did it end? 1781 at uh, Yorktown. Well, even John Adams, who was writing early on uh, about the history of the Revolutionary War, said, no, it started in 1760 with the beginning of the reaction to the Stamp Act. In 1760 to 1775, the revolution occurred. All this preceded that, plus the uh, actions that the British took, all this preceded the major combat operations that broke out in 1775. And after the Yorktown, the peace was not secured until, I would say, at least 1783, probably 1789, with the Constitutional Convention. So as a human phenomenon, as it's experienced, as it actually practiced in history, war, the, uh, war is much broader than just military operations. And these same three skills that I talked about in the war waging skills, a, figure out your aims, do your campaigns, make decisions, adapt as the war unfolds, and uh, maintain legitimacy, these same skills are necessary in the pre-combat operations, it, during combat operations, and post-combat operations. You can see it also in our Civil War. Civil War didn't start uh, 1861, didn't end 1865. It had a pre-period and a post-period, all of which, in a human sense, is, is the Civil War. War fighting, war waging, go together. Wars have beginnings, middles, and ends. Unfortunately, we look narrowly, we most Americans, whether you're military or not, my colleagues are, are the same, we define the war narrowly as the fighting. And in doing so, we miss out on two-thirds of, of war. We make the wrong decisions. We're not at war until the fighting starts. Ask the people of Ukraine whether that's true. And when the fighting stops, the war is over, Asked the people of Iraq uh, that question when we left in 2011. So we have plenty of experience, not just uh, our own, but historically, to tell us that the narrow definition of war is too, is too narrow, but for whatever reason, it's too hard to understand. And throughout, justice is part of every phase. How many, how many wars have broken out? How, many, how much fighting, I should say, has broken out because of injustice. And at the end of the war, how much is justice a key part in bringing some kind of lasting peace, even if it's not forever? A just peace is, uh, has a higher probability of lasting than an unjust one. Ask the people at the end of World War I how that worked out. Uh, so when you think about war as a human phenomena, you can go to the next slide, please. When you think about war as a, a human phenomenon, you should really think about, from my perspective, using force, because all uses of force have these four common characteristics. They have a teleological element, they have a purpose. It's not random violence, 
Even Al Qaeda has a purpose. They weren't just randomly violent on 9 11 and, and subsequently. Uh, number two, uh, there's an organizational element. There's tactical actions, individual battles, operational level, battles are joined together into campaigns, and strategic level, all toward a, uh, an aim. Every use of force uh, has the same characteristics. The third, uh, there are uh, functional similarities. The three skills have aims, have an organization to make decisions and adapt and maintain legitimacy. True for every use of force. And then last, um, uh, ontological element, that is all uses of force are the realm of violence, emotion, ambiguity, uncertainty. How things unfold uh, are never the way they thought that people thought they were going to unfold at the beginning. We started a revolutionary war thinking it was a short war. Uh, we thought uh, the short war in our civil war. The events in Ukraine are not unfolding as the way Putin had thought they were, or anyone else thought they were in the beginning. The ontological part of war, ambiguity, uncertainty, surprise, emotion, violence. So all uses of force share these characteristics, and all uses of force are um, amongst people. There's no antiseptic war. You can read as many books as you want. There's no such thing. Uh, ask the person who was bombed by a precision bomb. Was it antiseptic? No, it's not. Um, war is among the people who fight it, among their families, among the innocent that are always caught up in it. War is among politicians. War is among political leaders. War is among states or not states, other political communities. Uh, war is, uh, it has an institutional uh, dimension, and people run institutions. So war is always amongst the people. People always suffer from war. So uh, if you try to capture all this in an understanding of war has a beginning, middle, and end, an understanding of war that it's always amongst the people, an understanding of war has got these four characteristics that is fighting and waging, you must take a multidisciplinary approach to understanding this. It's not just a military function war. Well, if you narrowly define it as fighting, maybe it would be, but that's not historically accurate or experientially accurate. So you need a multidisciplinary approach. You know, next slide, please. And that's where the symposium in the fall is taking us. Uh, we want to bring together as many different kinds of people who are involved in war. They're not just military guys. They're diplomats, they're political leaders, they're national security experts, and you see the list on the bottom. All these people are involved in war if you understand war as more than fighting, if you understand war as a human phenomenon, if you understand war as it is actually experienced throughout history and as it is today. And go to the last slide, please. So that's what, in the fall, uh, we will try to do. Oops, I thought there was one more. No? No, that was it. So that's what we're going to try to do in the fall, is bring these experts together from a variety of, of uh, professional perspectives and have a discussion uh, among uh, the community, the citizenry on whose behalf wars are fought and wars are waged, uh, and bring out perhaps a richer understanding of the phenomena. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer your questions at the end. Good evening, everyone. President Jones, Dean Conway, Commandant Hill, Lieutenant Dubik, Provost Weissman. I would have loved to have joined you this evening in our consideration of the incredibly important topic of our discussion. However, the limitations of space and international time zones preclude my direct presence, either in person or even virtually. But here in Nigeria, I miss you all, and I'm with you in spirit as together we consider the topic of war, of peace, and of justice. Let me give you, if I may, a little background on this important symposium. The J. Sherwood McGinnis Jr. War, Peace, and Justice Symposium is named in honor of the late Sherwood McGinnis, who was the initial project director. 
Sherwood, a good friend of mine and all of you, and a pillar of our Carlisle community, passed away on November 18th, 2021. This symposium is dedicated to his memory. During the height of the pandemic in Carlisle, there was no one in our community, now your community, who volunteered more to help the people of Carlisle. In the summer of 2019, Colonel Scott Byrne, a retired Marine Colonel, and Dr. McGinnis, who was a retired career foreign service officer and an adjunct professor at Dickinson College, shared with me their vision of participating in and partnering with them in developing a symposium to illuminate the human drama of conflict and of war's impact on society. It was to be a cooperative effort in a community profoundly influenced by the presence of our distinguished war college and at that time by our wars in the Middle East. We all felt it was imperative for the entire community to be involved in this civil military dialogue. We all felt that this symposium could provide an opportunity to see conflict through an ethical lens, a moral lens, and an educational lens. We felt it crucial to consider both its impact on society and on those called upon to fight. We sought a better understanding of the nature of war and its many consequences. We sought a better understanding of how to make peace. And we considered it an urgent task then, and of course, it's even more urgent now. In the last 20 years, consider this. The United States has spent $2.5 trillion on the wars fought in the Middle East. 7,000 of our troops have been killed, 53,000 wounded, and more than 78,000 veterans have died from suicide. By one estimate, these wars have killed more than 330,000 civilians. So we are here tonight, you are together, as Russia has invaded Ukraine, and Europe stands on the precipice, gathered together to consider the compelling topic, transforming conflict, rethinking war, peace, and justice. We've come together because we seek to avoid those wars. The human race has learned a great deal about how to make war, but we've also learned a great deal about how to make peace as well, and that's well, not as well known. While conflict is inevitable, it can be understood, it can be shaped, it can be channeled, and it can be reduced. How do we forge a peace that is just and lasting? something worthy of all the great, the very great sacrifices made to achieve it and that are being made at this moment. We come together, the U.S. Army War College and Dickinson College, joined by the Penn State Dickinson Law School and the Carlisle community, and it's many different sorts of citizens. We come with a wealth and a wide variety of professional and educational and life experiences. We have much to share. I come to you from Nigeria. Here in northeastern Nigeria, a profoundly poor area, we have been at war for 10 years now, enduring the protracted Boko Haram insurrection and now widespread conflict throughout the northern part of this very large country between people who farm and nomadic herders. And yet Yola, the city where we're located, our campus, is a secure one. The conflict that has traumatized our region is not widespread here. This is not accidental. For here we have learned a few things about making peace. Here in a community half Christian and half Muslim, desperately poor, enmeshed in the ageless conflict between herders and farmers, here in Yola we're trying to cultivate peace. We've done this in part through a local organization spearheaded by AUN called the Adamawa Peace Initiative. It has taught me much. We have tried to build bridges over differences in a community somewhat segregated by religion and definitely by great disparities in wealth. We have consistently sought to truly understand our differences, our own assumptions, our own deep and often to, quite our, to ourselves quite invisible prejudices and to find points of commonality. I know this sounds simple-minded, easy, particularly at this moment in our collective history. But it is neither. It is a lot of hard, time-consuming, self-conscious, self-challenging work. 
What we have discovered is that in Yola, in spite of living next to each other for many generations, some in our two religious communities in this small city didn't know each other, hadn't been to each other's homes, didn't have friends in the other communities, neither the adults nor the children, had many misconceptions about each other, and prejudices, of course, because we all have prejudices. For all of us, really, we want to stick together with people like ourselves. When we get thrown together with those unlike ourselves, the result is often confusion, irritation, misunderstanding, which can lead to conflict. We often don't perceive our own culture, yet our culture and our subcultures ensure that we don't see the world in the same ways, value the same things. We do not make the, assumption, the same assumptions or behave in the same ways. We often assume that our ways are the right ones, the moral ones, and based on common sense. To the extent that others differ from us, theirs are not right and sometimes not moral. This can lead to defensiveness and fear, which in turn can lead to anger, conflict, and sometimes violence. In the case of Nigeria, such hatred has been deliberately fostered as a prelude to terrorism. In nearby Rwanda, it led to genocide. So how can education help us in this task? The answer comes in part, I believe, from the field of intercultural communication, dedicated to broadening our understanding of culture theirs and ours, and what happens when cultures collide. Mere goodwill is never enough. The aim is to foster a deeper understanding of ourselves and others, and to teach specific skills to help us bridge deep cultural chasms. This is a journey from often unreflective intolerance through denial, fear, defensiveness, naive, we're all the same acceptance, to understanding, inclusivity and appreciation. It's neither a short nor an easy journey for anyone. But in Nigeria, we learned that while misunderstanding and fear can be manipulated and fostered, so too can understanding, acceptance, and friendship. This is really important. We learned that if, we, if you set up deliberate structures in which people can organize around shared interests that respond to the causes of conflict, and often offer income-producing opportunities to reduce the profound poverty, if we could provi provide training in peace-building and intercultural competencies, ways for people to understand why they disagree, why they find themselves in conflict, and how they could overcome those differences, that has helped to keep the peace here. I'm here tonight to argue for programs to develop intercultural competency, a competency which allows us to better understand ourselves and ultimately to understand and respect and work with other people. The prototypes, the research, the techniques for achieving this competency all exist. They should, I believe, become a part of everyone's education, of everyone's skill set, particularly in America right now, where so many different kinds of people are finding it so difficult to understand and live with one another. Let's hope America is not on a precipice. We must fundamentally expand intercultural education to create and nurture tolerance of differences among people, opening one's minds to new possibilities, to new ways of seeing and understanding the world, to new ways of challenging our often quite invisible and unexamined assumptions and views. That's why I believe this is an essential educational component for our mobile and our global times, a fundamental skill set for a richer, more productive life and for the building of peace. Dickinson College, of course, is one of the pioneers in this type of education and has so much to offer the rest of the country and the world. But I'm not here tonight to tell you about Dickinson. You have with you tonight my very good friend and successor, the president of Dickinson College, the Honorable John Jones the former chairman of the board of Dickinson College, one of its most distinguished alums. President Jones retired from an outstanding career on the federal bench to lead his alma mater. Who better to address the question of justice without which no peace can long endure than President Jones? Thank you for having me with you tonight.
Well, good evening, everyone. I think I'm going to get started making comments. Is that okay by head nods? Fantastic. So my name is Danielle Conway, and to correct everyone in the room, I am Dean at Penn State Dickinson Law. That is the name. I wanna thank Dickinson College's now installed President John Jones for this invitation, former Dickinson College President Margie Ensign. I want to recognize Lieutenant General James Dubick and Major General David Hill. I also want to give my praise and thanks for the late J. Sherwood McGinnis Jr. for bringing this important symposium concept to our attention so that we could collectively respond to war, peace, and justice. So my role this evening is to talk about justice, hopefully in a comprehensive manner and in an evolving and more modernized manner. But first, I want to give a very basic definition of justice as I see it. Justice requires an act. It's an act premised on behavior, reflecting dignity toward and respect of all people. So while this definition seems quite accessible, we may think that it is easy to apply. And if that were the case, we wouldn't be sitting here watching the travesty of injustice breaching sovereign borders by Russia into Ukraine, nor the travesty of responses to that war, which is engaging the hierarchy to prefer some lives over others in terms of those who are trying to escape war. Specifically, I speak of Africans who are being assailed within the Ukraine and their guest status not being respected as they try to run from war. So we often like to think about conflict as emanating or stemming from prejudices or biases. And these are often hit at individual levels. But it is critical for us to understand that in fact, it is not the individual prejudices and biases that lead to conflict. It is the power that is retained by the hierarchy of peoples that is structurally encasing this malady in our society. As we attempt to address questions of justice and injustice, we must be careful not to lower everything down into that linear and pedantic ratio of individual acting in unjust ways. Rather, we must look at the concept of structural justice, transitional justice, and the opposite, systemic and structural injustice. So to add to the individualized definition of justice that I gave you, I'll cite Kofi Annan, the late uh, UN Secretary General's definition of transitional justice, meaning the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with a society's attempt to come to terms with a legacy of large scale past abuses in order to ensure accountability, serve justice, 
and achieve reconciliation. Mechanisms of transitional justice consist of both judicial and non-judicial processes and mechanisms, including prosecutorial initiatives, initiatives respecting truth and reconciliation, the delivery of reparations, institutional reform, and consultations. And these can be delivered individually or in concert. So I make this distinction so that we know we are talking about with respect to transitional justice, structures to accomplish justice on large scales. Another important concept in justice is, is something we've been talking about in terms of the spectrum of the act of war when it happens, how it happens and what happens. If we think about transitional justice at these structural levels along a spectrum, we have a great opportunity to disarm and to lean on diplomacy and to lean on intercultural competence that we just heard from former President Margie Ensign, to be responsive before we enter into conflict. But we must know that at every point on this spectrum is an opportunity to look at both hard law and soft law as vehicles to accomplish structural transitional justice. So if you can consider being in a pre-conflict posture, what are those mechanisms that we can use in hard law to ward off conflict? Well, we can address, address incursions. We can address individualized harms and not ignore them. We can come together in collective discussion, which is the purpose of the United Nations, to consider claims by other state bodies about what is happening between two states. If we move along the spectrum and we get to a position where there is conflict, an actual incursion into another's borders. We look at the hard mechanisms, the hard law mechanisms that are there. So we see some of those playing out between Russia and Ukraine, stronger sanctions, freezing of assets. But we really need to think about and be very clear and act quickly on what are the remedies available to us in order to quickly respond to and hopefully dissolve conflict. That means we have to understand the structures of a United Nations that might in this particular part of the spectrum be the arbiter of the conflict. And then along the spectrum, again, is the post-conflict. And this is, again, the importance of understanding structural responses and remedies of reconciliation, of truth, of reparations, and how they can actually respond to the harm that has occurred to all of the society, but particularly those marginalized by the conflict. I will conclude my remarks by saying that we must take an expansive view, a structural view of transitional justice. 
There are writings about the rule of law that can be made larger on a global context to come to a common understanding of how rule of law would apply across the globe with tenets like equality and realism. We mentioned the ahistoric nature of war. Well, realism accounts for the perspective and the history that undergirds, underlies the growth in conflict. But then the third tenet, the third principle of a global rule of law would be a commitment to understanding the inequities that are carried by states or marginalized groups and to reckon with it and to act according to these opportunities for transitional justice, be they criminal justice, historical justice, reparatory justice, administrative justice, or constitutional justice. So thank you for the opportunity to contribute these remarks, and I look forward to your questions. Hello. <clears throat> So welcome to the audience online. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this panel. And I, I want to take a moment to thank the organizers of this symposium, Scott and Bill and many others, in particular for naming this symposium in honor of my friend, uh, Sherwood McGinnis. Uh, Sherwood was a friend and a colleague in my Department of Political Science here at Dickinson College. Um, he had a deep love for education, for his students, for Dickinson and for Carlisle, um, as well as his daughter Claire, whom he spoke about frequently and with great affection. Um, I also will say that uh, Sherwood loved debating foreign policy. I mean, whenever I saw him, he wanted to get into the issue of the day. Um, and he was a student of history and cultures. So he did take a multidisciplinary uh, approach to understanding conflicts uh, around the world. Uh, and he was a trained diplomat, so he was always diplomatic in his approach. Uh, but his intellect was incisive. Uh, he could be a straight shooter. Um, and so that's a long introduction uh, to say that I hope right now I could be a straight shooter in uh, sort of the mirror image of Sherwood and get right to the point. Um, I, I'm going to push back a little bit on what all the previous speakers have said, uh, General Dubik, uh, Margie, and also Danielle. Um, uh, I, I'm pushing back because uh, we've heard a lot about war and justice, about multidisciplinary approaches to conflict, uh, about intercultural competency and communication and how that might uh, abate conflict, uh, about concepts of justice, right, and how complex and structural ju justice and transitional justice. And I think all these concepts Shearwood, I assume, would uh, subscribe to, and I think he did subscribe to. But my talk to you today is to transfer and transpose these notions into the current conflict that unfolded over the last seven days in Ukraine. And I think these approaches actually have a limited uh, utility in understanding why this conflict happened, and also I think has little utility in, in possibly have preventing the conflict from breaking out last week. Let me be specific. Uh, Ukraine and Russia do not lack in cultural, historical, social, economic, and linguistic ties, right? They are not misunderstood to each other at all as a people. Um, instead, I think a more useful paradigm for understanding what's going on in Ukraine with the Ukraine war is through international politics. Obviously, I am biased in this because I'm a political science, but I think it's very apt in this situation meaning 
political differences, particularly difference, differing uh, threat perceptions, uh, geopolitical competition, are what's driving this conflict. And this conflict deals primarily with two sets of differing political uh, uh, mindsets. One is about the future economic and political orientation of Ukraine. And the second set of political differences is about Russia's place in the world. Let me speak to both here. With regard to the Ukraine-specific dispute, Russian officials claim that Ukraine must be under a Russian sphere of influence. Using a warped view of history and security paranoia, Vladimir Putin declared last Monday in a speech that Ukraine was never truly a sovereign state. This is a shocking claim. This claim stabs at the heart of the international state system and the international uh, legal order, which is predicated and based upon the notion of sovereignty, right? In Putin's worldview, a neighboring state's freedom to choose its association, a Western-oriented Ukraine, is not acceptable and does not hold weight. He invaded Ukraine to ensure that it does not fall outside of Russia's orbit. For him, an independent Western-oriented Ukraine is a threat to Russia, and that's why he had to act. And this reminds me, and I think something that Cher would, if, if he were here, would agree, this reminds me of sort of a strange rerun of the Melian dialogue from Thucydides, right? Where the Melians are begging to the invading Athenians who are much larger, right? Begging them, look, we're not a threat to you. We're, we're no way a threat to you. Uh, we, will, we are neutral at the moment. We're not a part of any alliance. Uh, if you invade us, that's against international law. And the Athenians went ahead and did it anyway and wiped out that civilization. And I think what we're seeing today is something very reminiscent of what happened thousands of years ago in ancient Greece. But there's a second overarching geopolitical dispute at play in this conflict. And this is about Russia's desire to have a new position in the international order fueled by grievances and nostalgia for imperial greatness, Putin wishes to reorder the European international security system. His December demands for security assurances from the West uh, amount to a rolling back of the post-Cold War security order and the democratic gains in Central and Eastern Europe since 1990. He wishes to diminish American influence on the continent uh, divide Europe politically in order to bolster the status and influence of Russia. Putin's geopolitical viewpoint is in direct opposition to America and Europe's viewpoint. This is a viewpoint that champions freedom, human rights, the rule of law, mutual, uh, ben mutually beneficial economic development. The liberal international system supposedly dampens aggressiveness it supposedly prevents countries from redrawing borders through brute force. And that system is currently failing in Ukraine. It is not operating. If Putin succeeds in his grander scheme, his grander geopolitical scheme, it will spell the end of the liberal world order and America's global leadership. After a week of atrocities, witnessing them on, uh, on your cell phone, in the media, social media, after listening to a number of dangerous rantings uh, from various Russian and Belarusian officials, it's easy to point and paint to the leader of Russia as the villain, right? But beneath Putin's dictatorial veneer, there is a real clash of political differences, right? It's a clash of perspectives. And this clash is not going to go away anytime soon, right? It's going to last for years, if not decades. And there will be high tensions between the West and Russia. And the tension or the possibility of these tensions spilling over into direct conflict between NATO and, and, and Russia itself are, are not insignificant. Look, I believe uh, the Ukraine war signals a turning point in the international system. 
the 31, 32 years of the post-Cold War peace, which wasn't always peaceful in Europe, uh, particularly in the Balkans, but that post-Cold War peace is over, right? Europe and America will now be fixated on deterring and countering Russia for the foreseeable future. This means that there will be less appetite for expeditions and interventions in places such as North Africa, the Middle East, and elsewhere. Bringing this back to tonight's symposium, right? The questions posed here about justice in the international system, what is its nature, how is it carried out, about the impact of war, how that war, and how war in general uh, impacts societies and how it's prosecuted, about how to maintain peace. I think all of these issues are well worth exploring, particularly now and particularly in this symposium. However, I wish to emphasize that this symposium, which is more or less initiated tonight, uh, is being conducted under the shadow of a new war and the necessity of America and its partners to adjust to a long-term and difficult struggle whose outcomes have serious consequences for the future of this country and for the liberal world order. And if I may, I would like to think Sherwood would want us to consider, and going forward in this symposium, to debate what is currently going on and what is currently happening and to take these concepts that have been discussed already and presented and more will be presented throughout the num numerous events upcoming uh, throughout the spring and into the fall, to apply those to not only past conflicts and conflicts in general and theoretical concepts, but place them and spe specifically identify them in the current crisis that's going on in Ukraine and the current war and tragedy going on between Russia and Ukraine. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. It is now time for the question and answer session. Please type your questions for the panelists into the live chat box on YouTube. We will pose the questions submitted in the live chat to our panelists on behalf of our virtual audience. As a reminder, the live chat feature is for questions only. We will ask as many questions as time allows. Our first question is, what does just and unjust peace look like? Uh, Danielle, you want to start with, with that one? Okay. And it's Dean Conway in this forum, everyone. So, um, justice and in injustice. So, if you think about uh, separating that from the term peace, I think we'll have a better opportunity to uh, provide guideposts for your uh, encapsulation of the terms. Because, you know, to, to say that there is peace at all times belies what justice is meant to accomplish. So if we think about uh, ret retributive justice, we, we might be saying we have to create a punishment for a crime. <laughs> and that definition obviously includes some harm being done. So you don't want to actually conflate those two terms. But justice versus injustice are uh, sliding scale principles because they depend on the who and the how. So the United Nations, as well as other states and even domestic uh, nations have had to deal with the question of whose form of justice determines the definition. And so if we are looking at who, again, we have to go back to those hierarchies that have been established. And those hierarchies may be inherently unjust or unjust by virtue of who or what they may marginalize. So then the other question is the how question. 
how do we do justice? How do we respond to injustice? And so injustice can be viewed as the systemic or structural injury that occurs for which there is usually no direct perpetrator. There is also distributive injustice, where conflict occurs, war happens, say there is loss of access to land, you can't get that back. Because you can't get that back, that is an injustice. And this is where we often think about the idea of reparations as a response, as a justice response. But then again, you have to address the who. So if one sector or demographic is asked to respond to distributive injustices, the claim will be, it is unjust for me to have to give up what I have in order to distribute justice. Another definition of injustice is criminal injustice. The taking of life is a criminal injustice. Again, what is the appropriate response on the justice spectrum? And then there is transitional injustice. What political or civil harms have occurred as a result of a failure to respect the dignity and the humanity of others. So I hope with, with that exposition, you can see that there is no linear definition of justice or injustice. It really is relative and it requires addressing perspective and context. Can I... Uh add something, because I think there's something behind the question, maybe not intentional, so I don't, I don't want to attribute my reading into the question to the person who asked it, but it gets back to your point, I think, Andrew, about the million dialogue here. What's up for grabs is what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world where the strong prey on the weak, they do what they want when they want? This is the center of the million dialogue. And uh, I, I think this is uh, also then a question of just, is, is that the kind of world we want to live in? Is that just? Sometimes questions like this get asked because there's no universal definition of justice, so there is no justice. I think this is exactly the wrong kind of perspective to, uh, to have in asking these questions. Take the word justice off for a minute and just ask yourself, Will, uh, will we prosper, will the world prosper uh, in an arrangement where those who can do, where those who have the might make it, where might makes right? Is that the world we want to live in? Is that, is that uh, the kind of prosperity we want to have? That's, I think, in a very real way, what's up for grabs right now. And there will be no universal answer to that. Uh, it'll be... Uh, impartial, and in that way, sometimes, some ways, unsatisfactory. But I think that's part of the real world, the unsatisfactory answer to these questions, not the perfect answer, well, here's justice, I'll give you a three by five card. I don't think that happens. I think it works out. I don't know if I got it wrong there. Uh, no, I, I, I think both of you have, have kind of laid out uh, a vision for justice and unjust and, and injustice and what is meant by peace that's very complex, it's not an easy answer. It's not something that can be done on a, a card, as you say. Um, and, and it does take a spectrum. I, as a political scientist, I think about what more about the stability aspects of peace, right? Uh, not necessarily in terms of just and unjust, but uh, what, what makes for a stable, a stable peace? And that's one where uh, borders are respected, there's dialogue, there is some relative security amongst the entities interacting, uh, and there's also internal stability, meaning that citizens have their human rights respected, right? And that their life to, you know, their, their right to life, right to liberty, to choose, 
that's all respected by their own authorities, right? Um, it sounds like a nice world, but that's not the world we live in. That's, that's a goal, right? And it's going to take a long time to get to that goal. And uh, it, it's, I think, working towards it, right, combating it, and pointing out in instances of clear injustice and calling it what it is uh, will help us along that path and signal to others about, you know, sort of in a behavioral sense of what is good behavior, what is proper behavior. Thank you. I believe the next question is uh, pointed towards Professor Wolf. Is it possible to attain uh, lasting peace with, <laughs> with great dictatorial powers while simultaneously insisting on the objective superiority of our political and moral principles? Great question, and I think uh, I think it is achievable, right? I would I would say an international system without any morality, without any principles being espoused, would be incredibly chaotic, right? It would become sort of wild west, uh, anarchical system, right? And I think our ideals. Uh, allow participants, whether citizens, non-state actors, and state actors, to aspire to something higher, right? Um, are Western ideals superior? Are they uh, somehow, we're somehow better by espousing them? No, I don't think that. I think um, the world of, of, I would say, respect for minority rights, civil rights, the world for uh, giving people a voice in their government, uh, and governments disavowing the use of force, right? When there's a dispute, and there's always going to be disputes and clashing interests. Um, I, think, I think those those ideas are something good and worth working for, right? Um, and I don't think it's anything about superiority of systems. I think it creates a more stable and functioning world. Um, when you see these violations, when you see atrocities, it's, it's because the principles are not being followed by certain actors, by systems, by uh, entire uh, ethnic groups, religious groups, uh, societies, right? It, it, it's all very circumstantial, but you will always see someone violating these principles in which the UN and the current international system is, is founded upon, right? And, I've, and I would put the US in, in that camp too, because we have definitely violated these principles on numerous occasions. I think that's exactly right. If you get you, that's part of the process of understanding yourself and uh, have a, a capacity of self critique to be one of the actors in the world. Danielle, I don't know, I couldn't tell from the screen whether you wanted to weigh in on this or should we go to the next question? We can go to the question, next question again. Dean Conway, thank you. The next question is. Are wars really fought on behalf of the citizenry, or is that the ideological justification? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite get the question. Yeah. Are wars really fought on behalf of the citizenry, or is that the ideological justification? Borders? Wars. wars. Are wars really fought on behalf of the citizenry, or is that the ideological justification? Well, uh, in democracies, I would say that you have wars fought on behalf of the citizenry. That's not universally true. I think you can see that playing out right now. The, the war that uh, Russia has, uh, is waging and is fighting in Ukraine is not one of, in, uh, that represents the citizenry. Uh, so I think it's, uh, there's no one answer to it. But it's important, at least for, for me as a as a uh, American citizen, to be able to understand for our democracy that we should fight wars on behalf of our uh, citizenry. That it's important to include the citizenry as part of the way we look at uh, legitimacy. That doesn't mean that that's again going to be universal. But this is the political community whose uniform I wore and whose flag I wore. Now, that doesn't make it universally correct, but it does, uh, it does help us understand uh, our own political community, our own political 
uh, tradition. Anybody else want to weigh in? Okay, I guess next question. Directed at Dean Conway. Does accountability for past injustices encompass holding individuals or group groups accountable for crimes committed by their progenitors, even when they themselves are not actually culpable? So thank you for addressing me according to the title. I really appreciate that. Second, uh, I'm going to break that down because um, there are just layers that are happening. And so if my colleague, Professor Dermot Groom, were here, um, he, he prosecuted the uh, uh, Rodich trial. I mean, he would say that you have to prosecute the actors in order to uh, trace back to the systemic or societal uh, power brokers. I think that's what he would say. And that when you have the cause and the elements, you must prosecute even the individuals. And if I take your question to the military context, uh, if you did not do that, um, you would not be holding the actor accountable when the actor should have been responsible for not following an unlawful order. And so you don't want to set up that, uh, you don't want to set up that paradigm. And so you have to look at this from all levels. You have to look at it asymmetrically and follow the hard law in both the international context uh, as well as the domestic or individual context in the event that there is criminal injustice in which there must be a response. Yeah, I, I want to back up what Dean Conway is, is saying, and with a with an analogy, like after 1945, after the war ended, uh, the U.S. and uh, Britain and France put on trials uh, for war, uh, war crimes in Nuremberg, the Nuremberg war crime trials. Joseph Stalin didn't really understand what these trials were about. He thought justice would be just take all these Nazi leaders out and shoot them. That's justice. Um, and I think the Americans and the Brits and the French were right in insisting that there needs to be a public airing of their crimes, not only for all to see it, but to create a corpus of narratives and stories for history to go back to and read, to understand how men in, in positions of power could uh, perpetrate atrocities and crimes um, in order to hopefully in the future prevent that. So I, I think it is very much important that individuals are held accountable for crimes, particularly uh, in, in a war setting, right? The next question asks any of the panelists if you all can imagine a post-Putin Russia in the near future that reorients itself in a way that is more Western friendly. Yeah, I definitely can. Look, if you study Russian history, uh, Russia has gone through phases of westernizing and reaching out to the rest, to the West, uh, Peter the Great. And then there have been very oppressive Russian leaders who uh, are antagonistic towards the West, uh, you know, Ivan Terrible, um, a number of of czars. And they, it kind of swings back and forth. And even under the Soviet period, there were certain premiers that were much more hostile to the West and some that were reached out to the West, right? Reformers and hardliners. And I think right now we have a hardliner in, in Russia, in Putin. Um, I don't know who's coming after him or when that's going to happen. It could be someone even worse, right? <laughs> Hopefully not. It could be a reformer. Right, and I think there is a pattern there. Uh, and I think the Russian people don't want to be isolated from, 
from the developed world, the Western world, et cetera. I, I don't, Russia is a unique state that has its own uh, unique history and culture and, and perspective on things, but I don't think they want to be isolated uh, and sort of uh, pariahs or outcasts for a long time. This question is for any panelists. Do you consider the alarming suicide rates among U.S. combat veterans a military failure? Again, I apologize. I've got my hearing aids on, but the masks don't help me. It says, do you consider the alarming suicide rates among U.S. combat veterans a military failure? Uh, well, I take it to be uh, a sign of the uh, stress of combat. I see it also a sign that is shared with the rest of the country. So it uh, has a component of, uh, of military service. It also has a component of uh, the signs of the times or the social of the times. It, we, the military does have a a higher rate, uh, but it also has a concentration of the same age group and population uh, that uh, has higher suicide rates in a greater society as well. So, you know, from a former commander standpoint, naturally we want uh, every commander takes the suicide rate as a serious one and one to try to do everything you possibly can uh, to drive down, and we uh, there are some some ways to do that, but uh, on the other hand, uh, there are some aspects of the suicide, um, American suicide issue that are are broader than just military. So I don't I don't think I can really answer the question as uh, maybe the question asked or intended. I apologize. Anybody want to add? No. Okay. This concludes tonight's presentation. Thank you so much to our viewers for joining us.